Okay, I think we're on. Great. Okay, so welcome everybody to the New England Dynamics and Number Theory Seminar. Today's speaker is Demi Allen from Warwick. She will be speaking on an inhomogeneous version of the kinchin groshev theorem without monotonicity. Go ahead, Demi. All right, so um, thank you very much to the, the organizers for the invitation to give this talk today. Um, so eventually what I want to tell you about today is some recent joint work with Felipe in which we prove an inhomogeneous kinchin groshev theorem, which is free of monotonicity conditions. Um, but before we talk about the kinchin groshev theorem, um, let's start with the classical Kinchin's theorem. So suppose we have an approximating function of psi, um, and by this I just mean um, a function from the naturals to the non-negative reals. Then we define the psi well approximable points, which I'll denote by a psi, to be the set of points in the unit interval for which this inequality is satisfied infinitely often. So the psi well approximable points are the set of points in the unit interval which lie infinitely often within psi of q over q of a rational number with denominator q. And we have a classical theorem due to Kinchin which characterizes the Lebesgue measure of these sets. And so Kinchin's theorem tells us that the, for any approximating function psi, the Lebesgue measure of the psi well approximable points is zero if the sum from q equals one to infinity psi of q converges and is one, so full measure if the same sum diverges. And additionally, we have that psi is monotonic. Now, I want to note here that this monotonicity assumption on psi really is only attached to the divergence part uh, of this statement. So it's the case in Kinchin's theorem, and in fact, in many other statements of this form in Diophantine approximation, and in particular in all of the statements of this form that we'll see in this talk, that the convergence part of the statement Uh, is usually proved using a standard covering argument together with a fairly straightforward application of the convergence or the first Royal Cantelli lemma. And in particular, this doesn't care whether our approximating function is monotonic or not. So this monotonicity condition really does only come into play in the divergence part of Kinchin's theorem. And so we might wonder whether we really need this monotonicity assumption at all. And the answer in this case, in Kinchin's theorem, is yes, we, we really do need psi to be monotonic. And this was shown to be the case in 1941 by Duffin and Schaefer. Um, they constructed an example of a non-monotonic approximating function psi for which this sum diverged, but for which the Lebesgue measure of the corresponding set of psi well approximable points was zero. Now, in the same paper where Duffin and Schaefer presented this example, which demonstrates that we really do need the monotonicity of Psi in Kinchin's theorem, they also formulated a conjecture for what they thought ought to be true instead of Kinchin's theorem when we don't have monotonicity of Psi. And this conjecture is what we now know as the Duffin-Schaefer conjecture. So suppose we have an approximating function of Psi and let's consider the slightly modified set of psi well approximable points, which we'll denote by a dash psi, which consists of the set of points in the unit interval, which lie infinitely often within psi of q over q of a rational number with denominator q, but where all of these rationals now must be in reduced form. So the greatest common divisor of p and q must be one. Now, 
In this case, it's it's not difficult to show, again, using a covering argument and the, the convergence for our Cantelli lemma, that if this sum here converges, then the Lebesgue measure of this modified set of psi well approximable points will be zero. Um, so this phi here is just the Euler quotient function. Um, the Duffin Schaefer conjecture predicted that the corresponding divergence part of this statement should also be true. So the Duffin Schaefer conjecture is that if this sum um, diverges, then the Lebesgue measure of this modified set of psi well approximable points should be one. And for many years, this was arguably one of the most famous unsolved problems in Diophantine approximation until there was a recent big breakthrough and this conjecture was proved to be true by Kukalopoulos and Maynard. Um, so they announced their proof in 2019 and the paper was published last year. So this is a, an overview of the situation when we're thinking about one dimensional approximation in the reals, but we could also we could also think about approximation in higher dimensions and approximation in other settings. And so for the rest of the talk, the setting that I'm going to be interested in is approximation for systems of linear forms. So from now on, n and m will be integers greater than or equal to one. Um, psi will be an approximating function and I'll write double bar to denote the supremum norm of vectors. Um, so I know in this field, we usually use this to denote the distance to the nearest integer, but um, I shouldn't be needing that today. So hopefully there will be no confusion. And then we define the psi well approximable points in R to the N M, which we denote by A N M psi to be the set of points in the N M dimensional unit Q for which this inequality is satisfied infinitely often. So here we should think of X as being an N by M matrix. We should think of Q as being an N dimensional row vector. And we should think of P as being an M dimensional row vector. Maybe this is a good point to check that you can actually see um, what I'm writing. We can. Okay, good. Um, okay, so roughly we can think of the classical set of psi well approximable points as being the points in the unit interval, which can be well approximated at a given rate by rational numbers. And so very roughly here, we can think of the, these psi well approximable points as being the set of points in the NM dimensional unit cube, which can be well approximated at a given rate by rational planes. And in this setting, we have an analog of Kinchin's theorem, which tells us about the Lebesgue measure of these sets. Um, so here, this is the kinchin groshev theorem. And this tells us that for any approximating function psi, the Lebesgue measure of the psi well approximable points is zero if the sum from q equals one to infinity q to the n minus one psi of q to the m converges and is one. So full measure if the same sum diverges. And again, we have that psi is monotonic. And so we can ask the same question here. Do we really need monotonicity in this theorem? Well, if we take n and m both to be equal to one, then we just recover the classical set of psi well approximable points and the classical Kinchin's theorem. And so we know by the work of Duffin and Schaefer that in that case, we really do need the monotonicity assumption. However, it turns out that in all other cases, except for when n and m are both equal to one, we can in fact remove the monotonicity assumption from the Kinchin-Groshev theorem. And 
the the clear cut answer that we get in this case is really the culmination of work of several different people. So, <coughs> you know, um, we know by the work of Duffin and Schaefer that we do need monotonicity when n and m are equal to one. Then Gallagher showed that we don't require monotonicity when n is equal to one and m is greater than or equal to two. Then work of Springer shows us that we don't need monotonicity when n is greater than or equal to three. And then finally, in the homogeneous case, the story was completed in 2010 by Berezniewicz and Volani when they showed that we don't need monotonicity in the kinchin groshev theorem whenever the product of n and m is greater than one. So this is in all cases except when n and m are both equal to one, where we know that we really do need monotonicity. And it's worth noting that the proof that Berezniewicz and Volani give um, covers all of these possible cases when the product of n and m is greater than one at the same time, and so also includes the previously known results. Um, and I'll make a few remarks on their, their proof in just a moment, but first I'm going to um, draw a little diagram, which maybe helps to visualize what, what the situation is in the homogeneous case and kind of who, who did what. Um, so, These dots are intended to represent the NM dimensional Kinchin Groshev theorem. So let's put M down here and N over here. So, first of all, we know by the work of Duffin and Schaefer that when n and m are both equal to one, we can't remove monotonicity. Then we know by the work of Gallagher that if n is one and m is greater than or equal to three, we can remove monotonicity. And we know by the work of Springer that whenever n is greater than or equal to three, again, we can remove monotonicity. And then the remaining cases are dealt with in the work, uh, sorry, this Gallagher's result covers when n is greater than or m is greater than or equal to two. And then the remaining um, cases are dealt with in the work by Berezniewicz and Bellani, but as I mentioned before, their proof actually covers all possible cases except the one when n and m are both equal to one when we know that we can't remove monotonicity. Okay, so now I want to make a few comments on the proof that uh, Beres Novich and Volani give. So first of all, they consider a slightly modified set of psi well approximable points where they impose a primitivity condition. Um, so let, let's let a n m dash psi be the set of points in the n m dimensional unit cube for which this inequality is satisfied for infinitely many pairs p, q, but where the greatest common divisor of p and q is equal to one. Um, so what do I mean by greatest common divisor of these two vectors? Well, this is just the greatest common divisor of the entries of p and q. And hopefully it's not too difficult to see because of the additional constraints here that this set 
is a subset of the original set of psi well approximable points that we were interested in. And so it would certainly be sufficient to show that if this sum diverges, then the Lebesgue measure of the modified set of psi well approximable points is equal to one. And then the inclusion would give us full measure for the original set. But now, in fact, in the homogeneous case, in order to show that this modified set of psi well approximable points has full measure, is actually enough to show that it has positive measure. Um, and this is due to another result of Beresnevich and Bellani from 2008. So uh, the result says that, tells us that the Lebesgue measure of this modified set of psi well approximable points must either be zero or one, and there is no other possibility. And the same is also true for the original set of psi well approximable points. Um, so if we can show that we have positive measure, then we must in fact have full measure. Um, and for completeness, I, I just want to remark here that the general result was proved by Beresnevich and Villani in 2008, but um, the one dimensional cases were known earlier. So for the modified set of psi well approximable points, um, the one one case is due to Gallagher. And this is a result from 1961. And for the original set of psi well approximable points, the one one case is due to castles. And this is a result from 1950. Okay, so as I've said, the consequence of this is that now it would be enough to show that if this sum diverges, then this implies that the modified set of psi well approximable points has full measure, and then we, we would be done. Um, so to try to prove positive measure, we might try to use the divergence borel cantelli lemma. So let me remind you what this says. So the divergence borel cantelli lemma tells us that if we have a sequence of measurable sets in a finite measure space X, say, such that the sum of the measures of those sets diverges, then the measure of the limb sup of those sets, of the sequence of those sets, must be greater than or equal to the quantity on the right hand side here. So let me also remind you what I mean by the limb sup of the sequence of sets. Well, this is just the set of points in X which lie in infinitely many of the AQs. Now, another concept I want to remind you of is that if this quantity on the right-hand side here is positive, then we say that the, the AQ are quasi-independent on average. So let me now make one more observation here. So suppose for a fixed Q, we define this set A N M dashed cube side to be the set of points in the N M dimensional unit cube um, for which this inequality is satisfied for some P with the greatest common divisor of P and Q equal to one, then we can write the modified set of psi well approximable points as a limb sup of these sets. So now, if we could show that these sets were quasi-independent on average, it would follow from the divergence borel cantelli lemma that the modified set of psi well approximable points um, must have positive measure. And then by the result from the previous slide, we would know that it must have full measure. And then the original set of psi well approximable points would also have full measure. So of course I'm, I'm brushing quite a few details under the carpet and there, there is some work and various estimates that go into 
showing that these sets here are quasi independent on average. Um, but this is just kind of a, a summary of the, the proof strategy in the homogeneous case. So now we have a, a complete picture of the necessity of the monotonicity in the homogeneous kinching grotov theorem. What we've been interested in is the inhomogeneous kinching grotov theorem. So again, uh, n and m are integers greater than or equal to one. Um, psi is an approximating function. But now we also introduce an inhomogeneity parameter, y. And we define the inhomogeneously psi well approximable points to be the set of points in the n m dimensional unit cube for which this inequality is satisfied infinitely often. So roughly this is the set of points in the n m dimensional unit cube which can be well approximated at a given rate by rational planes which have been shifted in accordance with this inhomogeneity parameter y. And again, in this case, we have an analog of Kinchin's theorem or the, the kinchin groshev theorem, which tells us about the Lebesgue measure. So this is the inhomogeneous kinchin groshev theorem. And this tells us that for any approximating function psi, the Lebesgue measure of the inhomogeneously psi well approximable points is zero. If this sum here converges and is one, so full measure if the same sum diverges, um, psi is monotonic. Oh, and I should um, note here that if y is uh, zero, then this is this would just be the, the homogeneously the set of homogeneously well approximable points. So this um, inhomogeneous kinchin groshev theorem that I've written down here is the statement that we get by combining works of Seuss and Schmidt and Springer. Um, and hopefully you can see that aside from this superscript y, this theorem looks identical to the theorem um, that we had in the homogeneous case. And so the question that we've been interested in is to what extent is the monotonicity of psi necessary in the inhomogeneous kinchin grotov theorem? So the first thing um, to note is that homogeneous approximation is a special case of inhomogeneous approximation corresponding to the case when y is equal to zero. And so we know from the work of Duffin and Schaefer that when n and m are equal to one, we definitely do need monotonicity. So their work applies to the case when n and m are equal to one and y is zero. Um, but actually in a recent paper, maybe from 2017, Felipe showed that actually it doesn't matter what inhomogeneity parameter you have in the case when n and m is equal to one, you really can't remove monotonicity in that case. Okay, then the work of Springer also applies to the inhomogeneous setting and tells us that we don't need monotonicity when n is greater than or equal to three. But then actually as, as far as we are aware, after that, uh, nothing more concretely was known towards answering the, this question in the inhomogeneous case until very recently. So earlier this year, there was a paper by Han Yu where he showed that we don't need monotonicity when n is equal to one and m is greater than or equal to three. Um, and Han actually comments in his paper that he's sure that this result must already be known. Um, but we, we're not aware of this having been um, recorded anywhere in the literature before, uh, although maybe someone in this audience does know if this was already known. Um, and then very recently, Felipe and I showed that we can remove monotonicity from the inhomogeneous Kinchin-Groshev theorem whenever the product of n and m is greater than two. 
And again, in our uh, proof, we deal with all of the cases when the product of n and m is greater than two. And so our result also includes the previous results. Uh, so before I talk a bit about the idea, the, the main idea behind the proofs, um, let me again draw you another, another diagram kind of summarizing uh, the inhomogeneous situation. So these dots again are intended to represent the NM dimensional theorem. So we know by the work of Duffin and Schaefer, we can't remove monotonicity when N and M are equal to one. Then we know by the work of Springer that whenever N is greater than or equal to three, we can remove monotonicity. And the work of U tells us that whenever N is equal to one and M is greater than or equal to three, we can remove monotonicity. And then R work tells us that whenever the product of N and M is greater than two, we can remove monotonicity. But this does leave open the question of, well, what happens in these cases when the product of N and M is equal to two? And we suspect, or at least I suspect, that the inhomogeneous theory should be in line with the homogeneous theory in the sense that we, we, I think we should be able to remove monotonicity in those cases, but we haven't been able to prove this. Uh, what we have been able to say in this case, though, is that if we have some extra divergence, so if we have a stronger divergence condition, then we can remove the monotonicity condition. So let me give you some uh, more formal statements. So when the product of n and m is greater than two, we can show that for any approximating function, the conclusion of the inhomogeneous kinchin grotev theorem holds irrespective of whether the approximating function is monotonic or not. And then in the case when the product of n and m is equal to two, if we have some positive epsilon, we can show that for any approximating function, the Lebesgue measure of the inhomogeneously psi well approximable points is one if this sum here diverges. So I now want to spend a bit of time telling you about the kind of the main new idea behind um, our proofs. Um, but first, let me, maybe let me make a few more comments. So I thought for, I really thought for quite a long time that in order to prove the inhomogeneous kinchin grotev theorem without monotonicity, one perhaps ought to be able to follow the same approach as Berezhnevich and Bellani did in the homogeneous case. Uh, but the first obvious obstacle there is that in the homogeneous case, they have a zero one law, which tells us that the, the homogeneous the psi well approximable points either have Lebesgue measure zero or one. And so it's sufficient in that case to show positive measure. Uh, whereas as far as we know, in the inhomogeneous setting, we don't have such a zero one law. So that's kind of the first obvious obstacle to that approach. But then, even if we are perhaps willing to settle for positive measure, um, we might think, well, maybe we can still follow the same 
approach as Berezinovich and Volani did. Um, and you can, you can write down the natural analogous sets in the inhomogeneous case, and quite a few of the estimates in the paper by Berezinovich and Volani do transfer um, quite straightforwardly to the inhomogeneous setting. However, there are a few places where in where, where though there are a few estimates, a few key estimates in their paper where it really does seem to be significant that they're working in the homogeneous setting. Um, and it's not clear how or, or if it's possible to transfer those estimates to the inhomogeneous setting. Um, and one of the one of the issues is well, one of the issues when you try to um, prove the, the kind of the analogous estimates in the inhomogeneous case is that um, recall that in the homogeneous setting, uh, Beres, Navis, and Villani were looking at this modified set of psi well approximable points with a primitivity condition. Now, in some sense, so actually in, in our method, we don't have to, um, so, so this causes a problem when we want to prove the same estimates in the inhomogeneous case. Um, so one of the kind of advantages of our proof is that we don't at any point impose primitivity conditions. Um, of course, one of the, the obvious disadvantage of our proof is that we only get the result for when the product of N and M is greater than two, and we still don't know um, about what happens when the product of N and M is equal to two. Um, but anyway, we use a kind of, uh, instead we use a kind of different approach. And the key new idea in our proof, um, well, really it's kind of an observation, is something that we've been calling an independence inheritance phenomenon. So before I, before I give any more formal statements, let me again try to, to explain with a simple picture what, what the idea of this is. So again, these dots represent the NM dimensional kinchin groschev theorem. And basically the, the thing that we observed is that, so we can, for fixed Q, we can um, define the similar approximation sets like were defined in the homogeneous case. And then we can write the inhomogeneously psi well approximable points as a limb sup of those. And what we observed was that if the sets involved in the NM dimensional kinchin groschev theorem have, are, are quasi-independent on average, then the sets involved in the N in any in the N plus K M dimensional Kinchin Groshev theorem will also be quasi-independent on average. So the idea is kind of if if the sets involved at this level are quasi-independent on average, then everything above the sets underlying everything above will also be quasi-independent on average or say for a specific value of M, um, if we could show that we have quasi-independent on average for the sets here, everything above this would also have quasi-independence on average. So let me make this a little bit more formal. So for a fixed Y, let us define um, these sets A, N, M, y cube side to be the set of points in the nm dimensional unit cube for which this inequality is satisfied for some p and then we note that the inhomogeneously psi well approximable points can be expressed as a limb sup of these sets so let me now also remind you of the definition of quasi independence on average so we say that a sequence of measurable subsets is quasi-independent on average if this quantity is positive, 
so the way that I've written this here is very slightly different to the way that it's written earlier, but this um, formulation is slightly more, is kind of more directly applicable to our, our applications. And so the, the first aim is really to show that the sets underlying the NM dimensional Kinch and Groshev theorem are quasi independent on average. And so the observation that we made was that if the sets in the NM dimensional theorem are quasi independent on average, then so are these sets in the M plus K M dimensional theorem. Okay, so there's really you know, there's a scaling factor here, but this this comes out in the analysis. Um, but the the really the, the take home message is that if we have quasi independence on average um, at level n m, then we will also have quasi independence on average at level n plus k m. And in fact, we actually showed something stronger than this. Uh, so I don't. I don't want to give you the, the formal statement because it's really messy, but let me see if I can explain um, informally. Sorry, Demi, you, you may have uh, said this before. Uh, does the previous theorem require uh, NM to be bigger than two, the inheritance of independence? Uh, no. Okay, thanks. Um, no, it, it doesn't. This this phenomenon holds in general, but hopefully you are you um, hopefully you'll see after I explain the more the more general um, a more general version of this independence inheritance why we end up with the the condition the product of n and m being greater than two in our theorem. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, so we defined um, we defined a a variation on, on the definition of quasi independence on average, um, which we call W weak quasi independence on average, um, and this is kind of a way of quantifying. Maybe if we don't have um, true quasi-independence on average, but we have some sort of quasi-independence on average, just how much independence we have. And so our definition of W weak quasi-independence on average is such that uh, zero quasi-independence on average is equivalent to the usual definition. But then this is stronger than one quasi-independence on average. Um, and this is stronger than two quasi-independence on average um, and so on. And so what we actually observed was that if in the NM dimensional kinching groshev theorem, the underlying sets are W quasi-independent on average, then as we increase n, the underlying sets become, if we increase n by k, then the underlying sets become k steps more independent um, according to this definition. So let me perhaps give you a, an informal statement of our theorem. So we show that if the sets involved in the NM dimensional Kinch and Groshev theorem are W weakly quasi-independent on average, then for any K greater than or equal to zero, the sets 
involved in the n plus k m dimensional Kinchin-Groshev theorem. are k steps more independent in the sense that they will be the maximum of zero and w minus k quasi-independent on average. So in order to prove that we have quasi-independence on average in the nm case, it's enough to show that the set in the, sorry, in the n plus k m, in the, yeah, in the nm case are quasi-independent on average. Essentially, it's enough for us to show that the set in the 1m case are independent enough according to this definition here. So let me draw this picture again. So our result is that we don't need monotonicity in the, the inhomogeneous kinchin groshev theorem for everything to the right-hand side of this line I've just drawn. So we can show for the, the one M case when M is greater than or equal to three that we have quasi-independence on average. Then in the one, two case, what we're able to show is that we have one quasi-independence on average. So here we have one quasi-independence on average, but when we increase n by one, this becomes actual quasi-independence on average. So everything above is going to be quasi-independent on average. And then in the one, one case, we show that we have two quasi-independence on average. So here we have two quasi-independence on average. As we increase n by one, we have one quasi-independence on average. And if we go up another step, then we get a genuine quasi-independence on average for everything above. Um, so this is really the this is kind of the, the key new observation behind our proof. Uh, so just to reiterate, to show that we have quasi-independence and average for the sets in the NM dimensional case is enough to show by this, this more general version of independence inheritance that the sets in the one M dimensional case are independent enough. And then once we have quasi-independence on average, we, we need to do something to get to full measure. So in our case, um, this is a combination of uh, a kind of a mixing argument, um, the divergence borel cantelli lemma, and a, a kind of Lebesgue density type argument. So let me just say something about the, the final um, point here. Uh, so for simplicity, you've, you've probably seen uh, a theorem that says if we have a subset, say, of the unit interval, then if for any interval, I in the unit interval, we have that the measure of A intersected with I is greater than or equal to C, a constant times the measure of that interval, then this set A must have full measure. And so this, this is kind of the one of the ideas behind getting to full measure in our case, but we need a slightly more 
sophisticated version of this lemma. Um, and so we use uh, this lemma here, uh, which can be found in a paper by Beres, Levitz, Dickinson and Villani from 2006. Um, but I wonder if it's also, uh, maybe it appears somewhere before that. It's, it's not a uh, particularly complicated lemma. Um, but the, this lemma tells us that if we have a Borel subset A of a finite measure space X and some function um, F from non-negative reals to the non-negative reals, which is increasing with F of X tends to zero as X tends to zero, then if for every open set U in X, we have that the measure of A intersect with U is greater than or equal to F times the measure of U, then A must have full measure. So in the, the kind of the, the simple um, example I showed you on the slide before, that the function here is really just um, a constant times x. Uh, but in our applications, in our applications here, the function usually ends up being um, some constant times x squared. Uh, so this is this is kind of all I really wanted to say about the, the general proof strategy. Um, really the new, um, the, the key new idea was the independence inheritance. Um, so maybe I want to finish off by just uh, mentioning one more thing. Um, so the, our original aim was to prove an inhomogeneous version of the kinchin groschev theorem without monotonicity. Um, but actually using these ideas and the independence inheritance, we ended up proving a more general result, which the inhomogeneous kinchin groschev theorem is a special case of. Um, so suppose, sorry, can I just say, can you still see my slides? No, I can't. Hmm, that's strange. Did they just disappear? Just now, yeah. Okay, can you okay, see them? It's, it's, it's back, yes. Okay, yeah, so I was going to tell you about this more general statement that the, the inhomogeneous kinchin groschev theorem is a special case of. So suppose that capital phi is any sequence of balls and suppose that um, A and M capital psi, phi, uh, psi is the set of um, capital psi well approximable points. So this will be the set of points in the N M dimensional unit Q such that uh, QX plus P is in this ball for infinitely many pairs P and Q, then the more general theorem is that if the product of N and M is greater than two, then the Lebesgue measure of this more general set of capital psi well approximable points is zero if the sum from Q equals one to infinity Q to the M minus one uh, times the Lebesgue measure of BQ converges and is one, so full measure, if the same sum diverges. Now, let me finally just mention why um, the inhomogeneous kinchin groschev theorem is a special case of this. Well, in the inhomogeneous kinchin groschev theorem, we are interested in this set. And this set is just a special case of a set of this form when this when all of the balls are centered at our inhomogeneity parameter y and the radii of these balls are given by our approximating function lowercase psi. Um, and so I think that was everything I, I had intended to say. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, let's um, first thank Demi. Thank you very much, Demi.
And uh, are there any questions or comments? Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the uh, great work and great talk. Yes. Uh, so, can you say something more about uh, what makes the case m times n equal to two so hard or so different from the 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 technique the 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 method you used in the proof? Um, it comes down to some of the, basically the, the issue is in some of the um, overlap estimates that we have in the proof. And um, in those cases, they, they just, well, they don't, they don't work out as nicely as the, uh, as when we have higher, as when we have um, a larger product of N and M. Sorry, that doesn't really answer your question. Um, oh yeah, um, yeah, it's good. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so, so can I ask? I'm just curious. You mentioned uh, mixing as one of the ingredients. Uh, yeah. But so far, there was no dynamics. So, what exactly is mixing? Oh, okay. Probably I shouldn't have said mixing. I just mean. Um, in some of our lemmas, there's um, in the book by Springjuk, there's a there. Um, well, you have this quasi independent system, but uh, the question is if you want to prove them, does some kind of dynamical system help or not? Just give me. Um, the, I think by mixing all, I, I think probably I shouldn't really have said mixing. Um, I okay, think that's, that's fine. Probably the best. Um, it's just, so there, there is at some point, maybe you use the, um, the map like QX mod one um, and then there are... Yes, so is it what is used or not? Uh, yes, it is used at some point, but it's not, maybe not as in it as... Um, I mean, that itself isn't really a big feature of the proof. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's... Felipe disagrees with me. No, I mean, well, we, we've been calling it mixing, um, it's mixing like, and you could justify it dynamical means, but it's basically that if you fix an open set, <clears throat> say in the torus, and look at what these approximation sets look like, they're, they're essentially a striation of the torus into something like stripes that become extremely um, tightly packed and regular. Um, and the mixing uh, statement that we're saying is that these objects, the fixed open set and these uh, stripe-like approximation sets become asymptotically independent um, in a way that only depends on somehow the size of the, the denominator. Um, which you can justify uh, somehow through, through a dynamical uh, system. Thanks. That was a much better answer than mine. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I think, I think it's clear now. Are there other uh, questions, comments? Well, if not, uh, why don't we thank the speaker again? And we'll see you all next week. Same time, same place.